Oh, oh, oh. oh, we're back. We're we're tuned in. Well, I mean, honestly, Not when I all. talked to you at third term, I didn't think you were actually going to come here. So, what do you mean? Do I give off that vibe? <laughs> A little bit. I mean, <laughs> welcome everyone to an, another episode of the Campus Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Christians, and on this episode of the podcast, I'm sitting here with some members of the Ferris State University Ducks Unlimited chapter. This weekend, for our Collegiate Waterfowl Tour, we are at Ferris State highlighting these students uh, out here goose hunting. I, this was a very last minute trip. Uh, Jordan here, that's kind of in the middle of our set, uh, called me. What was it? Tuesday? Tuesday morning. Yeah. Tuesday Tuesday morning. And I like literally that afternoon I was gonna make a post on Instagram and like Jordan gives me a call saying that he's at he has birds out here. So Perfect timing. It was. It was meant to be. <laughs> and so now I booked my flight and flew up to Michigan. So here we are. Who would have thought? Right, right. Uh and this is <laughs> a little background, I guess. Uh Jordan has been like, I've known Jordan for a few years now. Probably, I think we met, like, at third term two mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. But even before third term, I knew of your name because of some of your photography yeah. on Instagram. Yep. Um, so I finally – and then I got a chance to meet you at third term. So um, it's been a few years. And, mm-hmm. and so now I finally get a chance to hunt with you. Yeah. So uh, we're definitely going to be – in this podcast, we'll definitely be talking about our adventures so far this weekend um, and kind of the game plan for tomorrow morning. Um, if you guys are watching the YouTube video, you can see we're kind of just hanging out in a, in a shop. <laughs> uh, just got done frying up some goose breasts that we'll have a video of later uh, in the next week or two. And then also some some fish as well. So that was kind of our – if the goose – fried goose didn't work out, we kind of – we had the <laughs> fish has better back Worked out, plan. though. <laughs> Always got a plan B there. That's right. We did. Pizza was plan C. Before we get into the podcast, uh, like you guys know, we got to thank some sponsors uh, of our Collegiate Waterfowl Tour. So first off, Kent Cartridge for sponsoring this tour. Thank you. Uh, they, they, this year they uh, came out with a new ammo called uh, Fast Steel Plus, which is a stacked load uh, this weekend. And then all throughout this hunting season, we're going to be running two fours. Okay, another thing I always forget, heavy breathing. Oh, that's probably me. <laughs> <laughs> This weekend and all uh, this hunting season, we're going to be shooting the Fast Steel Plus's two, four stack loads. Uh, so be on kind of the lookout in our videos for that. And then also we have to thank Benelli for sponsoring the season's Collegiate Waterfall Tour. You guys are all familiar with the Super Black Eagle 3, the M2 series. Uh, greatly appreciate their support. Like like you guys know, these are recorded on YouTube. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, you guys can take it on the road listen to so- Listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all your all those streaming platforms. But if you guys are watching, you can see there's four of us kind of sitting here. I got Sam to my right, and then Jordan and, and Colton. Um, you guys just want to give us a quick introduction of kind of what you guys are doing at Ferris State. Uh, sure. Sam, you want to kick yeah, us off? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, currently in my fourth year at Ferris State, um, I'm going for architecture and, yeah, I'll be graduating here in the spring and hopefully pursuing a master's degree right after that. So that should be fun. Uh, I'm also in my fourth year. Uh, my first two years were in architecture. Um, then I switched over. My last two have been in construction. So, um, I'm Colton. I'm also fourth year at Ferris. Um, I'm in the plastics program. And, yeah, kind of have a job lined up for once I graduate. So hopefully that transition goes well. But. And kind of like what I mentioned, we were talking about the DU chapter on campus that you guys started. If you guys are been listening to Campus Waterfall for a while, we've highlighted a lot of collegiate DU chapters. But I don't think we have sat down with a group of students that, that have started. I don't know if they, that if they started their own DU chapter. Uh, a lot of them, maybe a lot of them were, a lot of those chapters might have been um, existing already and they kind of just fell into the leadership roles of, of managing managing them. Um, but for Ferris State, they actually started the chapter what? How many? What you? This, this is, is going to be our third, third year. Third year. Third year now? Yep. Yeah. Um, what was that process like? That was actually Colton and um, – Egan, he actually graduated last year. They were the ones that started it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so our talks, we started talking with Mark Horbritz at DU in uh, actually the middle of summer and started getting stuff lined up for that. And we went into that year and went to third term and gained a lot of information from that, a lot that was able to um, help us kickstart 
the year in September once we actually went back to school. Um, but from there, it just kind of spiraled. That's how I met Jordan. Met him the first week of school because he, um, we met him from a friend of a friend, and mm -hmm. he fit in the group. So we um, added him, and now now we're here. Mm -hmm. Hunt together every weekend. and uh, Live together for, what, two? Uh, yeah, two, basically, wow. basically we'll call two it three years. years. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we basically lived at his house the first yeah. year we met. The first year we yeah. started the chapter, we kind of all just mm -hmm. were always at his house. That's how I met well, yeah. him. Like, first day freshman year, we <laughs> sat next to each other. We're from the same hometown, didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. You do, like, the freshman, like, say where you're from, where you <laughs> went to high school. Same hometown, different high school. So, that's how him and yeah. I met. That was crazy. Um, and I, I think the first year, it was kind of just, like, close friends. Um, kind of <sighs> hanging out all the time, but still getting done what we had to get done. Um, and a lot of help from uh, our regional director, Craig. Nice. Um, he was alongside mm -hmm. us. And then... Finally, in the second year, we kind of started to expand, um, get people outside of the friend group, like friends of friends. Mm -hmm. um, but still, we kind of had like our tight knit circle. Um, and then they actually all graduated it, last in December last year ish. Kind of, they were all around for like a semester, and then we had a semester where it was just him and I. And then we kind of we talked to Craig, and we realized like we got to expand this inner circle. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, we're at a point now where we've got people that we didn't even know as of before they joined the chapter and they're bringing friends around and we just slowly started growing bigger and bigger. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't know. We do have a live audience here this evening with us. Uh, so if you <laughs> not here, distracting at yes, all, not at all, <laughs> not at all. Uh, but we will get no. some input from them later in this podcast. We're getting some, yep. some great questions, I think, uh, for these guys to answer. <laughs> um, Colton, do you oh, want to – so I get geez. a lot of questions, too, from uh, students. They're wanting to get involved. Uh, a lot of them are even sometimes interested in starting their own DU chapter, and they just don't know what's the first step. What would you say was a good first step for you guys? The first step for us was just contacting somebody. And if you contact anybody at DU, they're going to point you in the right direction. So that was our – our thing, we took a shot in the dark and emailed somebody about it, and mm -hmm. luckily they were able to point us in the right direction to Mark, and then he was able to pass us down to the people we need to talk to to really get stuff moving and get all the um, official stuff okay. set. So. And was that just through a process of Google searches, would you say? Of yeah, I mean, <laughs> I found it from watching YouTube videos okay. and seeing previous DU episodes to get the idea of it, and Egan came to me with it, and he's like, is this something you'd like to help with? And gotcha. I'm like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So. And I, and I think just if anyone's listening and is interested, like you can feel free to message Campus Waterfall as well on Instagram. Um, if you didn't know, uh, Campus Waterfall is actually affiliated with Ducks Unlimited. We're, we're actually owned by, by DU. So um, I'm there in the office every day. So if you guys uh, message me, I can quickly get you in contact with someone uh, in the office to get the ball rolling. What about like on the college side? Did you guys have to work with staff or just – um, it was a, it was a struggle. Yeah, uh, it wasn't yeah. a struggle. I wouldn't say it was, um, I mean, we had to type up like our own constitution, which was a little weird. Mm -hmm. Um, but besides that, we, there, we got, we got an advisor, um, who I actually knew pretty well and he helped us out a lot with the university. The biggest thing was for us was getting a logo yeah. like approved. Okay. But other than that, I mean, our events, um, at first they were a little, eerie about them um but we actually found a banquet hall that they're familiar with and they approve all our bank because because since we're affiliated we have to run them through the school right. um but as far as tying into the university i mean we're not funded by them but um we use their buildings to have meetings right, um, right. but they're super lenient i mean there's rules we have to follow um guidelines that they set for us but other than that it wasn't it hasn't been too bad with the university, just more like branding stuff. and. Um, no, early on there were a few differences between what DU required and what the school required, but it was there was a lot of overlap in between the two, so it was a super easy process right. um, as far as actually getting registered and um, set to go once school kicked off. But Yeah, I think when you, when you said the Constitution, like that was probably the biggest struggle. Like the first thing in my head, I'm like, Chat GPT, baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, <was exactly>. like, <laughs> if that was the thing. It would have helped us out right. a lot. Yeah, three years sure. ago, that yeah. wasn't there, but now it's like I feel like you could 
Just kind of put like in that. a couple prompts and you can yeah. spit one out pretty yeah. quick. Yeah. We're getting some questions. Come on, already. Peanut Gallery. What you yeah, got what out there? Me? What what do, what, do you yeah, got? we should just do questions throughout. What do you got, Brent? We got first question of the evening. Well, what kind of events are you guys hosting at Ferris State for your DUB chapter? Uh, so we do a bingo event. Last year was actually our first year doing one. Um, it actually went fairly well, I'd say. I think we had 60 people at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do a bingo in December. And then we do our fall banquet or spring banquet. Spring. Yeah. Yep. So we do a banquet in March. Um, and that one, our first year, we almost sold out. And then last year was our second year, and we sold out in, what, three months? Yeah. I think we put mm-hmm. it out for we – a month early we had sold out. Mm-hmm. So um, those are our two events that we do. Um, this year we're yeah. – we don't really have another place we can go in town, sadly. So our max is two fifty, mm-hmm. um, but that's why we're doing two events, kind of break it up a little bit. All right. Yeah. So, but the yeah. bingo actually, we got that idea at third term last year. Yeah. It was when they yep, yep. somebody from a chapter downstate brought it up, and we brought it to our RD, and he was like, "Might as well try." He had heard of it, but had never really had anyone kind of spearhead just doing it. Mm-hmm. So we were like, well, we'll try it. We got, I mean, it was super easy to plan. Yeah. yeah. And we planned it in like two nights sitting down, ordered everything, and put tickets out for sale. So nice. nice. And I should I should note, too, it's like uh, you guys are, what, three? Is this your third year, you said? Our third year. Yep. Third yep. year. And when we were at your place um, just as earlier today, like you had your awards from third term up there. You have chapter of the year – or no – what was the first one? New chapter, new, of, new the chapter, year. New chapter of the year. Grand yeah. Slam and then a Grand bronze Slam, award. Bronze. That was right. 2022. Yeah, you won the last two years a bronze, and a, which is 25, more, more than 25000 yep. raised, yep. and then uh, and a Grand Slam award for the last two years. Yep, yep. So um, definitely your efforts are working, <laughs> all the work you guys are putting in. So is there any goals for this upcoming so term. our goal this year is to get out of that bronze category. Yeah. Uh, we want to move up. Last year we were close, not close enough, but uh, we're hoping this year to move up a category. Um, and our our biggest thing this year is to grow that inner circle. I mean, the last few years it's been like the same six people. Yeah. Um, and, and, and part of it is this him and I have lived together, so we just kind of – if we had something to talk about with the chapter, we'd just – talk about it while we were eating breakfast or something Mm -hmm. so we're trying to grow that inner circle so it's not just the same 10 people doing stuff all the time you know we've i mean we all our meetings this year so far have been 20 plus people um especially planning our bingo event we just did that tuesday um i think we invited people to stay afterwards to help us plan bingo and he had 10 kids stay to sit in um so just trying to make people feel involved um make them feel like they they're helping run the chapter too Mm -hmm. um i think that'll help us really hit that goal because then they'll be able to invite people to the banquet because they feel like they had a part in it Mm -hmm. so i think those are our two biggest goals and that silver is is it 50 yeah 50 50. 50. yeah so nice um and that's and that's a big challenge too you talked about just getting people involved it's it's tough in college because obviously you got a new group coming in and leaving every year and it's mm-hmm. kind of rotating through every three, four years roughly. And so getting right. people involved and identifying ones that want to kind of stay in, and uh, take those leadership roles and stuff. And so you're constantly in, in anything you do, you're always recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a big crucial thing. And, and I think a lot of people realize that through during COVID when everyone was kind of forced to not have the opportunity to recruit and a lot of those chapters kind of, uh, slowed up and then kind of some of them even just uh, died off and now they're kind of just starting up again so um, if you get, if anyone is listening and interested in starting a DU chapter yeah feel free to reach out um, or if you're interested want to get involved with one um, feel free to reach out as well just to see if there's one on your campus if you're un- unsure or not so mm-hmm. I think probably the easiest way um, anything else you guys want to talk about with your you guys DU chapter not a whole lot. Not that I can think of. I mean, starting a chapter is not as hard as people think it is. Not that I was there for the whole part of it. Yeah. I kind of came in late, but as far as, like, getting part of the university, planning a banquet, I mean, you get the right people, it's pretty 
pretty easy. And now we, we're at a point now where it's kind of just like a system we developed. I mean, obviously there's changes we make every year, but it's pretty straightforward and it's a lot of fun. I mean, that's how I met a lot of my new friends is through the DU chat. I mean, it's just people that think alike. We all like to hunt. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, meetings are always after dark. And everybody kind of just, it's like an unspoken rule, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you get to hang out with people that you probably never would have met if you didn't join a DU chapter. I mean, you don't just walk around campus looking for someone wearing a sick hat and walk up to them and say hi. <laughs> right. I mean, but if you're, if you're sitting in a meeting with 30 people, maybe you'll talk to them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But. And is it like those meetings, is it planning? And it's like very, I guess, uh, are they just kind of yeah you're just sitting there planning the whole time or is there like other meetings where you guys bring in like special guests or like you're maybe watching videos together like hunt videos together or anything like that what we tend to do is our our uh official meetings with the entire group tend to be on campus um it's the meetings off campus where there's a lot of time to interact with people like the past couple of years we've mm -hmm. done them at our house mm -hmm. and it just ends up being a big hangout we'll do work for like yeah. 15 20 minutes get our stuff done and that's just Thanks. time to talk and Fun. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how the hunting season's yeah. going or you guys hosted a tailgate too a couple two what? weeks ago two, two weeks yeah, homecoming two week, weekend yeah two weeks, yeah. Yeah. Two weeks ago that. yeah it was a lot of There's fun i was surprised a lot of, a lot of the new kids that happy. signed up showed up to it yeah nice and they i mean i tried to introduce them to people making them feel like they were a part of it so mm -hmm. i mean half is we're giving away free food <laughs> people love free food <laughs> so, and we had loud music yeah, it typically, it food and loud music typically yep. goes far at a tailgate. Music. That's right. So, uh, let's transition to the hunting in let's uh, Michigan more specifically. So, and I got to bring up too. So this is uh, <laughs> where's that? Where's that? <laughs> this one right here. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That's a good one. <laughs> um, oh shoot! <laughs> you did it. Hit it you again. know. Uh, so this is three years. We've been to Michigan three years in a row now, um, and it's it's been tough. It's it's tough hunting, um, and it, it's it's funny because because like we started at the far north side, started at uh, Lake Superior State in uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and then that was for duck opener. And then we went to Michigan State last year, hosted a tailgate there, hunted with uh, the Michigan State DU chapter there, uh, duck opener in that zone last year, and now we're in. Yeah, Ferris State, kind west, of side. west Side, west side, and we're here again. Kind of earlier part of the season. Yeah, um, third time's the charm. That's right, third well, time's the charm. Half the issue is you've been chasing ducks. Yeah, I mean, hey, hey, now, hey, now, <laughs> you yeah. gotta, you gotta hey, go, no. after, after, go after the geese. <laughs> you gotta look, stay in your lane. <laughs> stay in your lane. I've noticed, yeah, after being here for a day and a half now, you definitely got a, a goose crew and a duck crew. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and we and intermingle and we argue all the time about it. So yeah, yep. you guys are in your regular season now for uh, Canada's, right? As of tomorrow morning for South Zone. For South Zone. So, so Michigan splits it up into three zones, and North Zone is Upper Peninsula, and then Middle Zone is Upper um, Lower Peninsula to basically big rapids yeah. just south of big rapids okay. line so like this morning when we were hunting up in big rapids we were in the middle zone um so season opened up last weekend and now we jumped down to the south zone so season opens up tomorrow morning okay. for for both big ducks and geese again so and talking more so you guys have a early goose season too have you guys been getting did you guys get a chance to get out during the early goose season at all a little bit not a whole lot not as much the birds really didn't show up for no. the first couple of weeks. Mm. The first couple of weeks were 95 degrees and it was hot. Hot. We hunted. Uh, me and my buddies back home hunted a hayfield in uh, shorts, a t-shirt. Uh, it was it was a rough one. Our hide was terrible, but we ended up shooting a five man. Nice. Um, so it somehow it worked out. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how. It was uh, middle fresh cut hayfield. No hide whatsoever, and we uh, we decided to throw layouts out there, <laughs> but it worked. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What, what were you saying? So a new thing we've been trying this year. Um, it was kind of my buddy's idea was um, switching from like last year. We would always, if we were hunting a hayfield, it'd be all grass. If we were hunting a cornfield, we'd brush in with all corn. This year we've switched to all grass hides, whether it be hay, wheat. Um, tomorrow morning we're actually going to try it in a cornfield. Um, but we've been having really good luck with it. Hmm. Um, just 
I mean, you're like making yourself obvious, but you're blending in at the same time. Um, the geese have been seeming to react to it pretty well. I mean, we've been finishing birds hiding that way better than when we tried to blend in with the field. Really? So I feel like I don't know if it's because they're not picking us out as well. Um, I think they got used to looking for, like, a bump in the field, um, whereas now we look more like a little fence row out there. Right. So And right – so this year so far, you guys have been hunting – when you guys are in corn, uh, when you have that contrast, I guess, um, it's more silage, right? Yeah. This yeah. time of the year, it's all silage. Uh, they don't start picking fields till. Well, they just started shelling yeah. corn this week, right yeah. before right before the rain. We just had to roll yep. in today, so. But now we'll probably be at a little lull because it's been raining for two days straight. Yeah, it'll be another so. week before they actually get back out shelling once it's dried off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clean fields. Not really super easy to hide in. <laughs> so. Have you guys been changing out your grass um, from like when you guys were hunting hay versus the corn now, or? We actually haven't. Uh, we pulled out blinds this afternoon from that hunt from early season, which was three weeks ago, and touched it up a little bit. Um, but that's just to get us to the morning. I mean, we get out there in the morning, obviously. We'll touch it up a little bit and try to blend in with, with what's around. But um, typically, I mean, we get that base layer, and as long as it's dry and doesn't get moldy, we'll leave that for the whole season. Hmm. Oof, it's going to be a windy one tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's oh. That there. is the wind that we are hearing. <laughs> windy windy and wet. Yeah, tomorrow morning Monsoon. is the forecast is not going to be no. not going to be pretty. So Derek's going to have to dress wet like windy. an Eskimo. Wet yeah. and windy. Wet and windy. And the camera is not going <laughs> to greasy. Like, the camera is <laughs> not going to like it. It's going to be greasy tomorrow morning. <laughs> Yeah, let's get let's get a couple questions yeah. from our audience here. <laughs> the question we got was we had to talk about the weather. Why would we need to talk about the weather in this podcast? Why is it changes what? every second in this state? Yeah. It seems like yeah. I think Sunday be. it was eighty degrees. No, it was early. seventy-five. It was, yeah, it was. Yeah, and now it's sunny. Forty, and now it's for forty degrees, twenty mile an hour winds and rain. That's Michigan. Yep. And how With did you frost. guys? We had a frost, hard frost the other morning, which was weird. Yeah, that was what Wednesday morning. Yep, yep. Get a frost, frost and thirty degrees. Yep, early October. Yep. And how how much? So yeah, you you hear about you see and hear like all these different forecasts coming in and that you're seeing. Um, how is that changing up your guys's I guess game plan moving throughout <laughs> the weekend? Well, it's all last minute. So yeah. we we do a lot of uh, like planning the night before, but when it comes to weather, I mean. We'll see where they're sitting the night before, and then we get out there in the morning, and we'll see what the wind's doing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the only weather that we really stray away from is sunny, sunny and clear skies. Other than that, the birds will pretty much fly. If you get sunny and clear skies, I mean, pretty much anywhere, the birds will just sit all day, and they, they don't feed. But other than that, I mean, I mean tomorrow we're going to be hunting in the pouring rain in 10-mile-an-hour winds. So... I mean, I will say the one thing is we do look for fronts. Like even Cold though fronts, even yeah. though the weather's weird here and it, you never know what's going to be. Usually cool. they get when the fronts are coming right. Like so. the, like this cold front came in right at so Monday. Monday, yeah, Monday, Tuesday it rolled and in. And that pushed in a lot of new birds. Hmm. That's when I called you, because um, I mean we went from five six hundred local birds to Four. upwards of a thousand fifteen hundred in a day's worth of time so and they yeah and when you so like you're putting numbers behind your birds here um what are, where are you guys going like to look to see like just to get an idea of how many birds are in a general area are you guys like you go into the roost kind of right away to to see well so most of the birds around us roost on the river um, so it's kind of just sitting in a central location and just watching what's flying off the river. Um, and we got, we got a lot of wastewaters in Michigan. Okay. Um, so, and they report numbers pretty much every, every other day, every day. Yeah. I think it's every um, other day. And even just this week, those have almost doubled. Um, so. And plus geese. just, plus just driving around, you see a lot better looking mallards and woodies hanging out and. Um, even, so it, even if it's just a small ponds and there's two, three ducks sitting in, if there's better looking woodies, then 
just local birds mm-hmm. that are not fully plumed up yet, then we so, got we have some sort of a push at least. So you're really just looking at like a general consensus of an area that you typically scout, yeah. rather than going to mm-hmm. one singular location. Mm-hmm. We're familiar with all the areas, so usually if we're seeing birds in certain spots, we know they had to have shown up. Yeah. Just spots they don't hit early season. Right. But and then from there you're just kind of scouting, seeing where they're going, mm-hmm. um, figuring out what game plan of kind of for the weekends essentially yep. where you're going to be hunting. Yep. yep. It's constantly changing battle, that's for sure. How many miles do you guys think you guys are putting on a week when you're scouting? This week alone? I don't even want to know. Yeah, I don't, I don't even want to know. I think I was at the gas station every day. <laughs> Just because, I mean, you said you wanted two hunts, so to find a hunt for Friday, we were we were scrambling. I mean, the field we hunted this morning, I found Thursday night. No, it was Thursday morning. Ish. I got out of class. I drove up there and uh, – the landowner is actually cleaning his gutters and i was on the phone with him and i was like fresh cut cornfield birds are flying over it mm-hmm. he's like might as well go stop in there so i sat and talked to the guy for like 20 minutes at the end of the conversation he goes well, so what'd you stop here for it's like oh yeah i was wondering if we could uh i was wondering if we <laughs> could uh <laughs> goose on out there he's like yeah go for it so and then we luck caught up to us in the night we drove out there <laughs> after checking the field we were supposed to hunt not a bird in it they were just dumping into it so yeah i think yeah you guys both had uh like we went scouting thursday night you guys had a plan b we had, yeah. where all we the had way like, down to like e yeah right? there was we could have ended up in a marsh Right. Sadly, with a long walk that Jordan wouldn't have been happy about. <laughs> Thank goodness we found, found a field. Cause. And that, and that's, and I, I just want to make sure like the audience knows it's like, you're you're, you ha- the more times you go out to scout, it's like the more options you're kind of giving yourself yeah. of like seeing where the birds are moving. It's like okay, this could be a potential, and then the next night you go out, it's like, oh shoot, now they they move fields on mm-hmm. us, and it's like okay, now we gotta possibly get permission here, but yeah. then, which yet, is like what we went through like with tomorrow morning, right. I mean, we watched this field since Monday when I called you, mm-hmm. and we come 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 check it tonight when we're out scouting, and there's 80 birds in the field that we're supposed to hunt. And we go to the field to the south of it, and there's all our birds. Mm-hmm. So it's a, I mean, it's always a good idea to have a couple options because our plan A for this morning had 300 birds in it the night before. Yep, yep. And he went and sat it in the morning and. They just flew over it like it never even existed. Mm-hmm. So then we found we went to plan B, C. Then he started going out into the swamp. So then I got nervous. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a little backstory. Jordan Jordan likes his geese. I like my ducks. So we once we found out Derek was coming up here, we kind of agreed I would go look for the ducks and he would focus on his big birds that stay on dry land. That's why we were in a field two days in a row. <laughs> Yeah, because there's not a whole lot of ducks on the Big <laughs> Rapids no, right now. No. Nope. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Sky pandas. That's uh, dedicated to them. I like, I like kind of what we're going, what, what we're talking about here, like just different scenarios, because I feel like every every hunter goes through different scenarios. There's no it, – it's all unique to th- their certain area or whatever they're going through that week, whether if it's weather, birds, uh, working around, like getting permission – uh, other hunters in the area pressures like all these different things that could go wrong it's like you always have to be able to just pivot quick and uh change out a dime um and have a, <laughs> have a backup plan um so like say like we've been talking about yeah just kind of birds jumping fields here so you guys had for had a plan to hunt for field a let's say uh, your birds were in there yep. um, they jump fields to plan b but you can't get permission for plan b are you st- and Maybe, yeah, that, they just jump fields maybe across the section or whatever. Um, are you still going to hunt uh, field A if there's no birds in there? Uh, the way him and I like to set it up is we, most of the time our plan A, we have permission on it. And most of the time all of our plans line up with somehow we have permission on it at least um, to start with. If there's birds in the field we can't get on, we just kind of accept we can't get on. But then our – Plan B would fall to, okay, can we get to the field right next to it or kitty corner to it or something like that where we can still take advantage of them being in that field but still have a mm-hmm. semi-solid plan to go with. Depends, too, where the birds are coming from. I mean, if they're still flying over plan A, I'll 
100% go run traffic in the field. Right. Because they've been in there. They know how to work it. So if we go sit in there, the chances of them coming back are high. Um, but if they're if we got if they got to fly over Plan B to get to Plan A, then we're trying to see if Plan C is in front of Plan B. If that makes any sense. Right. Yeah. If there's another field kind of between where they're getting yeah, up to where, where they're, they're coming feeding. from to where they're going. Right. So if we can if if we can somehow get in between their roost and where they're trying to feed, we we're gonna go there. Mm-hmm. Um, it somehow before, ends up in the plan list. Yeah. I mean, it, traffic's never a bad idea, especially in Michigan. I mean, you could sit in a field that they're flying over, and you're, you'll pull the new bird. The locals are going to fly over you like you don't even exist probably. Mm-hmm. But you'll pull new birds down. Mm-hmm. And so how do you go about, say, okay, yeah, you're – even say you're in between the roost and the feed that they're going to, um, but yet – they just fly over you or they go around you. They're just not interested in your guys's, I guess, setup that you guys have. They land in field B. You just going to sit there all morning? No. No, what, we're, no. we're, we're we both get, pretty impatient. If we get so. to about like four flocks that just fly over us like we're not there, I'm probably walking to the you're, truck. You're already. calling it? You're going yeah. to probably already yeah. have the truck running. <laughs> Especially, I mean, oh, well, yeah, to stay on topic. But, I mean, if, if if I come outside in the morning, if we're setting up in a field and there's not a cloud in the sky and it's supposed to be sunny, decoys probably won't even hit the ground. <laughs> we'll go home and go back to bed. <laughs> and maybe, I mean, we've done it a couple times where we came back and hunted at night. But, mm-hmm. yeah, if they're flying over us like we're not there and we're we're calling, we got a big spread out. And if we're if we're trying to look big, I mean, you can put five dozen decoys out and look big. Mm-hmm. If they're at, if they're not even giving us a look, there's really no point in sitting there and wasting our time with it. So rather not educate them more and let them see more. Yeah. Stuff. So yeah, hmm. mm-hmm. yeah I didn't think of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so with your decoy spreads and like yeah, um, how is that varying versus like whether you're on the X or if you're running traffic? If we're on the X, I mean we're gonna mimic what they were doing the night before. Um, watching how they were working it the night before and try to mimic that. If we're trafficking, we're just trying to look big. I mean, we're spreading out wide, spacing birds out, maybe clumping a couple up here and there, but the biggest thing is to just look like there's a group of new birds sitting in this field. Take up a lot of ground space. Yeah, and make make them curious at what's going on, and then they come want to come check it out. So, but why wouldn't you want to uh, – playing devil's advocate here – uh, why wouldn't you want to mimic what they were doing in that other feed, though? Why would you want to just kind of just look massive, I guess, and just because we're trying to pull them off that feed, try to get their eyes off of the if there is birds in that field, try to get their eyes off that and onto us. So if there's birds there already that were in that field before you guys set up, are you saying? Well, if I mean, say the first two groups fly over us like we're not there, go right. sit in that field. So Third just group, in case if that scenario happens, yeah where they kind of go around you. You just want to make look bigger than yeah, that other group. look bigger and be more talkative, be louder, try to pull their attention to us rather than where they wanted to go originally. So, And a big thing with that is flagging them. Uh, we've had a lot of luck with that. Not um, so much this morning. This morning they just wanted to be talked straight to the ground. But so. they, they weren't – this morning, too, they weren't really flying – the ones we were trying to flag weren't flying yeah. anywhere near us. They were like a mile out. That mm-hmm. was more just because we were bored. Yeah. But, I mean, if they're if they're flying over top of you up until they're 50 yards out, 60 yards out, you can flag them. Maybe not even that. I'd, I'd go farther out than that. Maybe like 100 yards. Flag them to like 100 yards. Um, but, I mean, you can, you can tell pretty early on if they're interested or not. Mm-hmm. Either they're just – going oh, right over top of you or they're kind of giving you a little bit of a look right yeah you, yeah being being able to read the geese and just watching them how they're reacting to things mm-hmm. um, whether they're locked in coming to the decoys or like this morning there's like another group of geese probably a couple miles away where they're kind of you could tell they're locking in on those geese over our decoys and what what, what you guys were kind of giving them mm-hmm. it seemed like what about decoy spreads as a whole um whether you're how long do we want to argue about <laughs> this right. him and i right. go back this is a, a couple hours so you guys so a lot say okay so now we're on the x where you guys are in the, the feed where the, the birds want to be 
kind of sounded kind of cool on the X on the feed. On the X on the feed. Where the birds want to be. Where the birds want Big to be. Feeds. Oh, it all rhymes. It's it's kind of, it kind of just flowed right there. there. That could yep. be like a catchphrase yeah. for you. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Big feeds only. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, yeah, you you guys are trying to mimic the, the, uh, the birds from the night before. Um, is there anything that you guys do to, like, put a little twist on it to kind of help that you think anything – I mean, you, you want to go into your half and I'll go into my half? Well, so him and I are always going to – he likes to run small spreads. Yep. I like to run big – not big spreads, but, I mean, the biggest thing is you never want to put spreads. more decoys out than were out there the night before uh, if you're on the X. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, a typical spread for me is anywhere from five to eight dozen full bodies. Um, but that's kind of a big range. Yeah. But he'll put out a dozen and hunt over No, a no, not like a dozen. But there was a time where you put three decoys out. <laughs> yeah, did I shoot we birds over ditch. it? No. <laughs> yeah. A crow. You shot a crow. All right. Anyway. We sat in a ditch Besides over three the decoys. Point. And he shot, a, <laughs> he shot a crow. All right. Jordan and I are going to argue about this forever. He's a big spread guy. I like to run less than – Three, three dozen or less decoys. If I'm on the X, I will say. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm on the X, I want to go small and I want to be natural. Go big or go home. <laughs> I mean, this is I why mean, we if, argue. If, if, on the, field, on about if the this. field's small enough, this is not. I mean, we've never done this, but like, why not black out the whole field and give them one place to land? Why I'm not? kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> No, you're not. You're not kidding at all. all. There's a camera right there. They can see you're not kidding. I've never done that before in my life. (laughs) Never. We don't have enough to do that. This morning would have been a perfect time. You could have this morning. We have about eight acres to work with. (laughs) I want to hear um, just kind of your pitch. And the other person cannot. All right. I see. Deal. Interject or anything. I just Deal. want to hear your pitch of, of why a smaller spread and then why a larger spread. So, oh, I, see, he can't he can't even back it up. <laughs> when? Jordan, no, I'll back it. Jordan, you want to go first? You can go first. Ladies first. <laughs> Lovely. Appreciate it. So my thing is, if I'm on the X and running a small spread, one most of the time I can make a small spread look more natural, at least around here in Michigan. Uh, I mean, unless the field's kind of like what we're hunting tomorrow morning then there's different circumstances um but like most of the time early season we're hunting 100 to 200 geese so running three dozen decoys you can make it look super natural don't have to call a whole lot because you don't need to make up for the noise for the um small groups and it's a lot easier to run with one or two guys than you know eight nine seven i mean Mine comes more from just like I've never had bad luck over a big spread. Um, I think it also comes from he hunts a lot of smaller fields, whereas we're hunting. I grew up hunting a lot of big fields where we had a lot of competition. I had to get the birds to look over at us. Um, I mean, it's just kind of always worked for me. So why change it? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've hunted over the same five dozen decoys for four or five years, and Every single time, I mean, he'll tell me to put out three dozen, and somehow all five end up in the field. I don't know how, but it just kind of happens. It's crazy. It's, it's almost crazy. like you keep standing by the trailer and I just think, grabbing I just off think the when shelf. You, every time I look at, like, three dozen decoys, I'm like, this just doesn't look good. There's just not <laughs> enough birds out there right now. So then you put a couple more, and then it, it's just – All I'm saying is he grew up hunting 200 bird feeds. We grew up hunting five, 600 bird feeds. So, I mean – we always put out a bigger spread because we were hunting a bigger group of birds. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Can they hear him? No, not really. You have to re- repeat what he said. So early season, I mean, we're not throwing out 10 dozen decoys. I mean, early season, we're throwing out five dozen. That's our typical. Um, hey, you just took your word back. I like this. I like where this is going. Why are you laughing at that? Five dozen is not a small spread. I went with three. Also, you don't <laughs> own five dozen decoys to put out. That's why no, you're I only don't. putting out three dozen. Because <laughs> I've killed my limits over 16 decoys before. What do you want, six? I've done that too. 
I hope I hope a lot of you or yeah viewers Ooh, and listeners gosh. can relate to these kind of arguments with maybe some of their peers. Probably. Yeah, and I live with this kid, so it's Probably. a day I mean, in day out deal. When, when you brother. when you show up with your decoys still in bags, you got to put them together. I mean, <laughs> yeah, because when you use six of them, it don't matter. Okay, uh-huh. so we're on the same. We're on the topic of decoys still. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go. Oh, we were talking about like time of year. So early season, yes. we're not throwing out huge spreads, but the later you get in the year we're throwing out more and more. So like last year, end of the year, we were hunting in the snow. That That is a va- valid, valid point. So you're trying to centralize the Restate what Brent said. So like early season, we're hunting, there's like one X, you're hunting the local birds. There's not multiple feeds in town. Whereas now uh, we're mid season, we're starting to get to a point where there's multiple feeds, birds are bouncing around constantly. So we're putting out a bigger spread because we're trying to centralize that feed. We're still hunting an X. We're hunting our group of birds that were there the night before, but we're still trying to pull in those birds that are just kind of flying around town looking for somewhere to feed or going somewhere else to feed. Mm-hmm. We're trying to pull them into where we are. Gotcha. And what about so types of decoys, um, full bodies, silhouettes? Is there – Full bodies. That's one thing we can agree on. Full bodies. (laughs) That is one thing we will agree on. Silhouettes have not worked for us. Hmm. I mean, Hmm. socks are are hit or miss as well. Hmm. Full bodies. Especially here. We we love full bodies. Socks is a no-go. I mean, we've done it. We've done it before. It's just – We don't get the wind. No. Michigan's normally not a consistent wind. Yeah, we get like a five-mile-an-hour wind. Sometimes (laughs) you get a (laughs) 15-mile-an-hour wind. Uh, but even then, I mean, they're not enough to push a sock up. Silhouettes we've used. Um, the only time we'll really pull out silhouettes is when we're trying to make a spread look big, like in a trafficking situation. Just more filling, fill, like yeah, more filling, filling the more filler stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if we're using silos, we're putting out our full body spread, wide spread out, and then putting silos like filling in around it. Yeah. We're never. I've never once hunted only silos. Mm-hmm. There's people that do. Not us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not Good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where we'll yep. leave that. Mm-hmm. Before we go down a giant rabbit yeah, hole there. Yeah, we need to go down a rabbit hole. We got – so we're kind of just working uh, point by point here. So decoys, I feel like we cover pr- pretty well. Let's talk about hide. Uh, so you, mm. you touched on, yeah, how you're brushing in your layouts and – are you doing that to A-frames as well this year, just kind of going strictly grass? Stri- well, I, when we get the motivation to brush in our A-frames, we will. Um, kinda, that's but, throwing shade at the audience, by the yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we opened up the trailer today and saw that the frames still have, didn't have brush on them, so we're like, oh, we'll just hunt layouts in the morning. Do you guys have a preference of uh, A-frames or layouts? I love layouts. One, because you can take a little nap. <laughs> No, not actually, because the birds are always flying. No, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, you love to take naps. I do like to take naps. Yeah. I like layouts better. I think they hide better. I think too many people around I think it here really depends. started using A-frames, and the birds kind of got used to it, and they started picking them out of a field. Because it went to a shift where people got away from layouts and went to strictly A-frames or panels and mm-hmm. just, oh, put out in the middle of the field. And they had luck with it. I'm not saying it didn't work. But we got kind of to a point where you get later in the year and the birds can pick that out. They're not – they're flaring off of it. Right. So we've kind of resorted to layouts, and we've had really good luck with it the last two seasons. I mean, it's rare that we're pulling out an A-frame. We did it last year one time. I will say, especially when everyone starts running A-frames once regular season yeah. opens, then uh, especially yeah. once all the corn gets cut because everybody around here throws – Throws an A-frame out in the middle of a silage field. Mm-hmm. Especially if they have a big group. Right. Their, their first yeah. go-to is, oh, we'll do an A-frame. Which, I mean, we were we going to do it. We're going to do it. But, I mean, if you – if you where we're at with this new, like, grass hide thing is if we're putting – like, tomorrow we're going to have eight people out there all in layouts. The goal is to, like, look like our own fence row mm-hmm. out there with all the grass. Yeah, like a drainage ditch. You're going more for a drainage ditch look than a – yeah, you're not trying to stand out. You're just, I mean, kind of, you're kind of standing out a little bit. but You're being obvious, but you're hiding in plain sight. Yeah, you're hiding in plain sight. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the thing we found is when you brush in with grass, you can hide basically everything. 
Whereas corn, you, like the stalks are distinct. You can see blind edges. Mm -hmm. Whereas grass, you throw it over your face. We basically make it so you can't really see out of it. Just an obnoxious yes. grass. Yeah, yes. like you're, you're almost chewing on it <laughs> while you're laying there. <laughs> Hide that you guys are hiding. Unless you're one of the callers to read birds, then there's a little bit of wiggle room with some of that. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited to see how I didn't – no, I didn't even think of that, of having that contrast of – seeing and it makes sense yeah with the field that we're going to be in like it did have those kind of um grass mm -hmm. you could call it gaps i guess but mm -hmm. throughout the field um and so yeah if we're going to try to mimic one of those i think the geese will we're gonna try mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are not we arguing we're not gonna keep going about that no <laughs> we talked about that i mean because i kind of put you in a corner so yep. not really i just you did. no <laughs> you needed brent to bail you out of the corner that i had you in if, if I mean, for everybody on video if, if you only got three <laughs> yeah. dozen decoys throw three dozen decoys but if you got five if you can call you can use six decoys and get away with it well that's half the issue is i can't call all right, I'm, not hiding, right. I'm not hiding anything. There we go. I mean, I mean Derek got Flux it on video. On video. Derek, Derek got it on video this morning. I'm a background caller. That is valid. I sit back and just just cluck moan. What about anything that you guys have learned over the years that you think might be useful for someone listening to this podcast? What way we want to start this? A good hide's better than a big spread. I'll say it. Finally admit it. I will. Only I will admit that. Years. I Only will admit that. Three years to get that out. I'm of still them. throwing a big spread, but I mean that was a big thing going into Mar even this morning. Not, not really this morning's hunt. That was kind of we only had that field. Yeah. But like tomorrow morning's hunt, we're choosing the field that has the best hide. We can blend. I mean the field that we were planning on hunting still has birds in it, but it's a clean cut silage field. So it's. It'd take a lot to hide into it. Whereas the one we're going to hunt, like you said, has those drainage ditches in it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a much better hide going into it. Um, I mean, that's our biggest. I mean, when we get to a field, the first thing we're doing is throwing the blinds down and brushing those in. Well, typically he's brushing blinds in. And I'll go start throwing decoys. Yep. But yep. we focus more on the hide than we do the spread and then work out from there. Mm -hmm. Well, since he hit on the hide, um, I'll hit on with uh, just learning how to read birds in general. Um, not just for calling aspect, just reading them and seeing where they're trying to go mm -hmm. and where they actually want to be. Because like we were dealing with the past couple of days, there were birds in fields, but it was like they really didn't want to be in that field. They were in it because they got shot out of the one they really wanted to be into. Um, and from like a calling side, just learning how to read wing beats if they start slowing down or start looking and stuff like that then take and run with it and uh really learning how to pick out that one bird that wants to respond to whatever you're giving it mm -hmm. and then try and focus on him because if you can turn him chances are you can turn more than just him so and like i said like 15 times when we were hunt scouting last night like he said with watching birds where they're at we're at a point in the state where it's silage season Birds are going to be in corn, so why is there 150 birds in a hay field? It's just not. It's not normal. It's not normal. So when we see 150 birds in a hay field, we're not getting excited about it. We're like, why are they in that field? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually why why are they there is the first question that we yeah comes out of our mouth. What, pu what pushed them to that field? Because it's not where they want to be at all. Yeah. Even though it would be easier to hide there, mm -hmm. the chances of them coming back to a hay field when they've got a – Fresh cut cornfield, All right? Are slim. Well, no, I want to hear yeah. from Serba. Yeah, what's your piece of a few you guys just rambled off a few a few less years of yeah. So hunting. obviously Jordan and Colton are way more well versed in the knowledge of waterfowl hunting. Um, growing up, I was just a deer hunter, and that was it. And then I met these two yahoos, and they introduced me to bought his first gun the dark last side. Year. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no more of that deer hunting yeah. stuff, whatever that is. I'd say, is. honestly, I don't even remember the question, but. It was a piece was, of advice. Yeah, piece yeah. Of advice. there's something that you've learned that's kind of just stuck out to you. Just get out there and go do it. Like, if you can find a group of friends that are willing to take you out, go and do it. Because you may not be for it. Like, originally I was like, oh, this is going to be stupid. But then, like, all the memories that we've made in the blind and all the fun times that we've shared, it's it's unbelievable. and. Yeah, I'll probably carry those forever. So just getting out there and getting after it is just something 
something to do. Way, way to go, the sun amount of Yeah, we're getting yeah. serious. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Well, I don't, I don't <laughs> have any knowledge up in cow. this head, so what I about, figured I'd go to the heart. So you've been uh, – <laughs> I think I think this is a good good talking point because how long have you been hunting, Sam? Like waterfowl hunting? Yeah. Um, gee, I started sophomore year of college, so that was three years ago. Three years now. So have you picked up anything about just like – how to set up decoys, hide, or just like how to waterfowl hunt. Like, do you think you could go out by yourself? <laughs> don't touch um, it. <laughs> honestly, no, I don't think I could go out by myself because I do not know how to blow a call to save my life. But I think setting up a spread, setting up a hide, I could, I could probably figure it out. Figure that out. Yeah. What about I've what, what brushed about in a few blinds? <laughs> Jordan's the one who touches the decoys, so I <laughs> couldn't tell you how to do that, but. Jordan, you got to teach him these things. you got to yeah. teach him your ways. No, teach he's, him to, he's I mean, picky about I, his decoys. I even he's stay out of Jordan's way. Decoys. Yeah. you got to teach him how to throw out the big spreads. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mostly learned from my buddy just watching him. Yeah. I mean, my buddy who we're hunting with tomorrow, even if you touch a decoy five seconds later, he's going back and moving it right away. Yep. So I kind of learned just from <laughs> just from watching him, seeing – you know, this is what the feed was the night before. This is what he threw. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, setting the spread's not the big thing, I'd say. It's more like how you adapt it during the hunt. Right. I mean, even like this morning, I think we moved the spread around four different times, five different times, just based on how the birds were. And the darker in daylight. <laughs> yeah. The mm-hmm. dark and the day. The daylight will hit you every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time. You're, you think you got a good spread set, and then the daylight hits, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> who set that? Did, I, did I do that? So, I mean, we're always, I mean, we'll set it in the dark. You get a rough, rough spread going. But I'd say 95% of the time we're moving it right at first light. Mm-hmm. And then as the hunt goes on, you watch how the birds are working it, how they're reacting, and then you just keep adjusting it as the hunt goes. Yeah. I mean, each each time you get a new flock, you can somewhat change it around. You're always running out to get birds. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah so change, do you think those – like I think a lot of hunters do do those things, make those changes, whether if it's in the decoy spreads or if it's their calling. Do you think those changes actually make a difference versus compared to like just the difference of like this group of birds that are coming in and how they are coming in or just those current conditions or just anything, everything else? Well, we can get into one about this morning. So, um, I mean, the changes definitely help. It's just, when you make them most of the time so this morning we kind of hit a wall um three or four flocks did the same exact thing and it just it wasn't working for whatever reason certain time i don't know if his son got up to a certain height and they were um doing something different or whatnot jordan may not agree because it's on the video from this morning but they wanted to finish out far on this point so i mean in a situation like that my instant go-to is pull them end birds off pull them in closer if they want to finish on the end of the line let them do it but that end of the line's gonna be cut in so hopefully at least when they're doing it they're in range and not sailing so far out um i mean you're not you're more moving them just so the birds finish better i mean if birds are flaring obviously you got to fix something right most of the time um, but if, most, most of the time, time if they're flaring it's hide though yeah if they yeah most of the time when you're moving decoys it's just cuz the birds are finishing too far out they're not sitting close enough mm-hmm. say the peanut gallery yeah. say so, the peanut yeah. gallery so my buddy he made a good point um a big transition we made the last few years was setting the decoys off the blinds um i mean 4 years ago it was always put the blinds in the kill hole and make a U shape around you. But the birds would pick that out in a heartbeat. So a big thing we switched to is you set the, you set the blinds and then set the spread away from it so that they're, cause when they're looking, the birds are constantly scanning mm-hmm. and if they pick out, they'll pick out those blinds in a heartbeat if there's just a random hole missing out of them. So that was a big transition we made is just sitting off the decoys and finishing them either side shooting them or, just having a space between you and where the birds are landing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole goal is keep your keep their eyes off the blinds and yeah, because they're 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 looking at the decoys and just scanning and looking for something. Mm-hmm. They're looking for something that they don't like, and if they're looking at the decoys and all of a sudden they see a black hole, well, 
like you're going to stand out like a sore thumb to them. Yeah. And then they flare. So we actually got that idea um, mostly just from watching, like, other videos on YouTube, like guides that are out hunting, mm -hmm. listening to podcasts, um, just taking advice from those guys that are out there basically every day. Like, this is their full-time job, killing mm -hmm. birds. Taking their advice and especially pulling it out of different states. I mean, birds from out – I mean, birds react different in every state, but trying new things um, and just kind of working out finding what worked for us, and then we kind of just stuck to it, mm -hmm. making minor changes here and there. But just finding a system that works for us that's different from what other people in our state are doing right. to try and, try and set us apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just got to differentiate yourself where you can. Yeah. Can't keep throwing the same thing at them over and over and over again. And the, like you say that – for the purpose of, like, you have seen noticeable, like, birds do pick up on mm -hmm. certain spreads and, yeah. you know, and I mean, hides and things like that. Like, the typical typical thing is, like, a U-shape. Give them a kill hole. Well, birds are, birds are picking up on that. A J, a hook. Right. I mean, I mean, the thing he always gives me a hard time for is in the dark, I'm always setting hard lines. And no, no natural spread is cutting a straight line or in a straight hook. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can mimic it in a sense, but you're not actually making the shape out there. Like with a like with the hook, like breaking it up by putting out like family groups, rather than just setting a solid spread of decoys that go out in a hook. Mm -hmm. Put a little group here, a little group there, kind of. I mean, zigzag kind of sorta. Don't don't go in the same pattern over and over and right. over again. Yeah, yeah, having those that. Make it look natural. Yeah, kind yeah. Of. A, hard, a hard line's not natural. A U shape in the middle of the field's not natural. <laughs> so you can still have, say, like those guide, like I'll call them guiding lines. Like obviously they're not super hard lines, but still they're guiding the There's birds. There's an edge. It's yeah, a feathered edge. edge. Right. Um, so you can still have those and still make it look natural. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what you guys have used and yeah. mm -hmm. the way you've positioned your hide uh, to help get the birds where you want them to be. Especially now when we're dealing with more migrators, they're more clumped up. They want to be, they're more comfortably being closer to each other mm -hmm. rather than family groups that want to be spread out all over the field. They're mm -hmm. a little bit more compact and tighter, so you can get away with more just soft feathered edges and stuff like that. So and it's getting colder. As it gets colder, the birds tend to condense themselves more, more and more. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, as the weather changes, our spreads are changing constantly. Um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say we go to a field and have a spread in mind ever, kind of. We've got a place we want to sit and kind of a general idea. Other than trying to mimic what they did the night before and figuring out how we can position it to finish them yeah. where we want them. But then it's constantly changing. I mean, get out there, it's changing. I'm going to ask Sam, like, how he feels about all this, like, information. Do you feel like you've learned something in this podcast? Um, I feel like... This podcast is an every night discussion at our house on a daily basis. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's every it single is. night. So um, constant bickering. It's we're, like yeah. we're, we're it's but, big brother, little brother yeah, situation. Sit down and do homework yeah. and see who can win the argument that night. Yeah. One thing I did learn actually was like the grass hides. That's something that I never really thought about. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah. It's different. Hiding mm -hmm. in plain sight. It's something mm -hmm. different. Just testing it out. It, it yeah. works now, but it might not work right. in a few yeah. weeks. It's yeah. different. It's worked yeah. for us the last four or five yeah. hunts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. I mean, I mean, and that's the other thing, too, with changing the spread. I mean, I, I mean, as your hunt progresses, your hide slowly deteriorates. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. your layouts, you're blowing doors open, losing brush. Panels, you're coming out the ends of it, pulling brush with you. A-frame, same thing. I mean, every time you stand up, you're blowing brush out of the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the worst is when you get the kids that need to be able to see everything they're looking at because then they just blow a hole wide open <laughs> and you're constantly throwing brush over them. So, I mean, you're, you're constantly adapting your hide, too, as the hunt goes on. Um, same, same to the portion of season you're in. Whether your yeah. opening day of early goose season is a little different than going into – You can hunt a uh, fresh-cut hayfield in layouts and yeah. get away with it in late versus like a late november hunt where you're yeah. hunting pure migrators yeah. yeah like now i mean you're getting to a point where birds have seen a little bit of everything so they're starting to pick that stuff out again they're realizing oh this is the time of year that we're going to get shot 
Right. As far as geese in yeah. this state, so yeah. yeah, geese in this. I mean, it's a it's a small state in a sense. I mean, yeah. We kind of bounce birds around all over the state. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you just. I I would say just geographically, like you're in an interesting position in the country where obviously you're surrounded by the Great Lakes, and so mm-hmm. just where these birds are coming from is just kind of unique too. Because like I don't know really how the migration really works. Like where are these birds coming from? <laughs> I I shot a band that came out of New York a few years ago in early season in September. So it seems they kind of follow the state. There's there's certain lines where there's agriculture that follows. Definitely like west side. We have Lake Michigan on the west side, so they follow the lake shore coming down. Um, East side, there's the bay, the Detroit River, St. Clair, all that stuff that they tend to follow. Mm -hmm. But then right down the center of the state, there's a big flat corn yeah. fields everywhere you look flat agriculture lane that kind of runs down through there and uh they there's a lot of birds that follow that so but then in between those you get gaps where it's heavily wood and basically what people think of michigan mm-hmm. um, for the most part and there's not a ton of birds in those areas but there's still opportunities big rapids is kind of on the edge of the um big rapids is kind of on the um middle middle flyway ish kind of on the edge so we still get some of the birds coming off that but um not so far out of the out of the way that we don't get stuff traveling through so i hope this podcast has been just a good kind of uh way for listeners and viewers to kind of just reflect on what they're doing or maybe going to be doing this hunting season gives them um at this point just go out there if things aren't working obviously you got to change them up Mm -hmm. yep Um, don't don't be afraid to make changes right right because Obviously, they're they're not nothing's working. So you, no. might, you might as well, might as well just, try something new, right? Um, and so, yeah, you can make changes to the decoy spreads, like we talked about, the calling, uh, the hide, um, just all these different things. So, mm-hmm. um, even some of your scouting, scouting too. So, yeah, all these different things can can be switched, can be changed up to hopefully better your hunt the next time you guys go out. Yep. So, um, really, only takes. You might have a few bad hunts, but it only takes one good hunt to make it all kind of mm-hmm. worth it, it yep. seems like. Yep. And that stands true for the whitetail hunting, I, w- I would say. Is that – would you say that, Sam? I would 100% agree with Oh, yeah. 100% oh, yeah. agree I said that. I was going to wrap this up, but now we're going to yeah. get into oh, whitetail. Oh, no, oh, now we're yeah. in a loophole. You sit all season for one hunt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one afternoon or one morning. <laughs> yep. No. Maybe a 30-second encounter, and that's all you get. That's all you need. I do want uh, to just – Give Sam the floor here to say anything that he wants to say to help anyone out there that might be going out to the tree stand uh, here in the, in the, the Ooh, next few months. Next here. I want to hear this one. <laughs> Stay in bed and go shoot some geese. <laughs> Aim low. Oh, wow. Good one. Sorry. Wow. Good one. Sorry. Good one. Good one. Good one. Wow. No, just, just be persistent, you know. Um, even if, you know, you're not seeing anything or – you know, you're just feeling down on yourself. Just be persistent. Continue to check the weather, check the wind. Um, just keep everything the same also. And just, you know, if you have a good wind and you have a good weather and there's a cold front coming in, chances are you're going to see something. So just being persistent and staying on them, that's, that's honestly the biggest, hmm. biggest encouragement I can give you is just keep at it because something's bound to slip up. And once it does, it's... You better make it count because that's, that's what you train all summer for. So mm-hmm. That's wild that you, like we were talking about just like making changes the entire time. And then it's yeah. like you go to yeah. Whitetail, it's like just stay, keep just everything the same. Just be persistent. Yeah, you got to be consistent with yes. that one. That's the one thing. You can't shoot them in bed. Nope. With that's anything. Mm-hmm. Can't shoot them in bed. If you ain't out there, you ain't going to shoot them. Also. Is, is there any things that you look for that kind of like get you a little bit more excited the next day that you go out or anything? Yeah, so I run a lot of cell cameras and just looking at what's coming in and what's coming off the property and seeing, like, okay, I think this buck's bedded on the property, so chances are I'm going to see him in the morning or vice versa. But um, seeing a lot of doe sign at night kind of, I wouldn't say discourages me, but having 30 does come out into the field like I did the other night Mm -hmm. and not have a care in the world for me but second it gets dark they start blowing at me like crazy so it's like okay 
Thing is, though, too you, many does. You have the does. You'll have the bucks at right? some point. I know they'll <laughs> bring them in, but is that is I that don't. just a matter of time then until yeah. kind of like the yeah the yeah. rut comes? Yeah, so yeah. early season, a lot of does. Probably won't be any bucks that you'll see, but we're we're still a couple of weeks once out. Once the from. rut hits and you've got hot does on your property, it will. It's crazy. Can all change real, yes. real quick. It will get wild. Is there benefits to just hunting? Like some people, like we were talking about kind of this weekend, just just hunting the rut. A <laughs> uh, farmer. Uh, <laughs> like, do you do you see like I mean all, all the time that you go out there sitting in the blind, like or yeah, sitting in the tree stand? Is it worth it versus just maybe those few weeks that you do have that movement? Or you think you have that movement? I, I'll let you go first on this one. I've killed more deer out of the rut than during the rut, but I see a lot of more deer activity during the rut. So it's, it's hard to say mm. if it's worth just hunting the rut or hunting all season because, I mean, during the rut, you never know what's going to come through, right? So mm-hmm. you could be bringing a buck two miles off your property sure. that you've never seen before. Yeah, like like you're saying over there, it's the rut's a wild card. But when it comes to like for, say the first week of season, those deer are still on summer patterns. Yeah. So if you can get a um, a nice night early season, then either that or uh, even really any October cold front, especially around this time of year. Like we were just talking about early on in this podcast, the cold front that came in for the birds also helped the also helped the deer movement. That's right. for sure. Big um, time. Yeah. But same with late season, you get a um, December snowstorm coming in and the deer have to feed just like the birds. So, yep. I'm just yeah. smiling here because <laughs> I'm falling asleep. Right we now. we talked. We switched we knew to this white. was gonna happen. We switched to white tail. And, and George is just Jordan sitting here, goes just quiet. He's quiet. We had just, this talk last night in the truck. <laughs> can't smile like anything. Can't move around. Can't Gotta talk. Be quiet. Yeah. Can't smell. Can't move. Can't talk. Do you like that peace and quiet? Love it. Oh, I it, hate it. it is nice. I hate it. I like a mix of both, though. I'll do it every once in a while. When I get burned out, burned out of either bird hunting or deer hunting, mm-hmm. I go do the other, and it yeah. makes it's up for it. Especially like up. a like tomorrow morning, bad deer hunting morning is yep. usually shaped. And also to be going a good back in the field. to the, like the whole being persistent thing. Don't be over persistent. Like don't overdo it and blow up your chances of not seeing anything. Mm-hmm. Like it's. It's hard to judge. Mm-hmm. Got to be smart. Awesome. I think that's a great kind of way to wrap up the the campus waterfowl in a, in a, a little bit of whitetail in yep. there. Campus whitetail. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Keep bird hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, any any last remarks that you guys might have that you guys want to wrap up with? I think it was a it, was, it went good. It was a good podcast. More like a normal Very, dinner talk. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can all agree it's more like it's Jordan like and I night. arguing over dinner, <laughs> yep, just like every other night at school. Than me being the mediator. Yep. No, just you're actually deal awake this time. Usually you're in bed. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But, all right. Well, well, Don't give up. Stick to nope. it. Stick. That's right. Yeah. We'll, see, we'll see how the morning goes, that's for sure. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, it's going to be wet and cold. And muddy. Yeah, that don't bother It's anybody. going to be an adventure out there. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, it's well, be great. for the great. viewers, you guys, and listeners, you guys will be able to watch all of our upcoming, well, yesterday's or today's hunt, morning hunt, and then tomorrow's hunt here in the next week or two after following this podcast. Uh, those will be on our YouTube channel and along with our uh, goose breast recipe that we did this evening. Fried some, We fried some goose breast, so you guys will be able to watch that as well um, but we're, that's going to do it here at ferris state university i appreciate you guys letting me come up here highlighting you guys hanging out and everything um, sitting down for an hour this evening it's uh midnight here <laughs> so uh, just about gotta mm. get some sleep and uh, then wake up early oh yeah See you well, in five we're, hours. we're all glad to have you up here so awesome. it's been a fun yeah. time mcdonald's sure. is gonna hit different in the morning <laughs> it, yeah 5 a.m for sure um you can get that coffee I know you are yeah. about that coffee in the morning. I'll get, I'll get some coffee. So um, that's going to do it here again at Ferris State. Appreciate everyone for watching and, and listening. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.